that she'll get all of our all of our chat. <laughs> Yeah, um, so now we're a full year into it, and now I can see, like, the whole benefits of it all and how my kids thrive in this kind of environment. So it's it's been amazing. So I can't I can't complain at this point, but we all have, I mean, we're always de-schooling, right? We all have our, our fears that creep up and everything else. So, yeah. Absolutely. Clubhouse has been kind of interesting. That's how I met a lot of people that I hadn't, you know, you end up kind of in your own little echo chamber for a while. And and so it was nice to expand out and meet Karima and Tyra and all these different people, Robin. Um, okay, so let me get, let's do it. Mary said in the chat that her, her kids, audio is not an option, always unschooled, struggling with my youngest, 11, 13, and 14. And they started in 1998. I did not know that, Mary. Um, okay, let me come over here to all right so what i'm gonna do okay so akila i'll just pause for a second so you'll know to just start so you'll have the recording so here we are to talk about how to unschool school subjects and i am going to share a screen with you I'll make it big. And I will stop the side. It's for me. Okay. So the quick answer is like Karima said, how do you unschool school subjects? Well, you don't. <laughs> but it's not that simple, is it? I mean, it's simple. But it's hard to get okay with that. We, don't, we have a lot of conditioning to overcome. And one of the biggest obstacles to this concept is why not? Why don't you figure out how to do school subjects? I remember when we first started and I thought, if I just make them more enticing, or maybe I took them out of order and based it on their interests, then I could make sure they didn't have gaps happen. And then we could um, cover all of it but I needed to go back a little bit further. Instead of asking why not, I needed to ask why, why do it this way? Why do unschoolers move away from subjects? Don't they want their kids to be educated? <laughs> of course they do. And the why is because dividing life into arbitrary subjects, whether you're interested in them or not, all because someday you might need it, it doesn't work. It doesn't stick. So subjects focus on the teaching, not the kids or the learners. And all the research shows that when kids are interested in the topics, they retain it. When we step back and think about a school day without feeling defensive of it because it's so familiar, who really learns seven different subjects in one day? In real life, now that you're an adult, don't you just engage in things that bring you joy? Don't you explore more? maybe one or two new things at a time because you're interested, but running all the kids through all the subjects, whether they're interested or not, isn't gonna be effective. And a terrible use of eight hours a day, five days a week for 12 years. So when you opt for the unschooling approach, you focus on the learner. That's your jumping off place. The school and their ideas, their scopes and sequences, they're no longer relevant. We're looking at what's needed in real life now. Let's just do a quick overview. If you're newish to unschooling, remember all humans are hardwired to learn. Everybody has interests and curiosities and the brain helps you create a truly individualized body of knowledge. And this is the opposite of what we've all been told. We've been told that parents need an expert and kids need the basics first. And if we do this wrong, their future is ruined. <laughs> it is not true. We can always learn what we need when we need it. Modern day learning isn't reliant on some teacher to bring us the info. We have Google, we have YouTube, and 10 years from now, those will be dinosaurs too. But our unschooled kids 
will know how to find the resources they need to do what they want to do. And then that becomes the catalyst that they need. So let's go back to our questioning lady. And that's what I want to show you today, where learning is hiding in everyday life. How you don't need to orchestrate everything so kids are prepared. You need to learn to notice what's happening around you. And I already said that sometimes people get nervous when I say that. Maybe you were a good student and you bought into them saying you had to learn things you weren't interested in because someday, someday you might need it. And so you hacked the system and you did okay. And now I'm telling you that it was probably mostly unnecessary. How many of those things that didn't interest you, how many of them did you really retain? How many do you use today? And a lot of those things that you weren't interested in didn't stick because it had no relevance. It wasn't in context. And you know that if you discover later down the road, oh, I think I would kind of like to understand that, then you just go to YouTube and learn it. It didn't take years and years of hoping I can hold on to it because someday I might need it. So don't panic. I'll show you how all of this works. Maybe you can put down that hyperventilating bag. <laughs> But first, in case we haven't met, I'm Sue Patterson, and um, I run all the things that are unschooling mom to mom. So, you know, we stepped away from the school system in 1996. And like I said earlier, my three kids are 33, 31, and 28, and doors didn't close for them because we chose this unconventional path. And something that happened to me during this journey is I learned about how kids really learn. I learned how I wanted to parent. I learned how the world offers everything they need. And all of that's what I wanna show you. So you don't get trapped into doing things because school said so. Thousands of unschooling families are living proof that this is not true. So let's see. I know that families are sometimes having a hard time, and that's one of the reasons I, I've created so many different platforms and opportunities for parents to learn. I want you if, to get past the power struggles and the guilt and the frustration. None of that has to be. It just has to come from getting okay with doing something individualized. You know, that's an interesting thing that we say, um, oh, we should individualize the child's learning. And then we do it as a multiplication or as a um, multiple choice test. And that's not really individualizing. Individualizing is allowing the individual to move in the direction, trusting that biology that they're hardwired to learn. So that's what I do with all these different opportunities to figure out whichever way works best for you. That's how we can connect. So here's the thing to remember, real life isn't divided into subjects. So instead of subjects, I want you to think about activities that you do with the kids or that they do alone. What learning do you see weaving through it? You know, learning comes from their interests, any interests, interests that we kind of poo poo <laughs> or that we think, oh, that's fluff. Or like they were talking earlier, we did everything except for math, that that had to be handled differently. You know, and I would put to you the idea that sometimes the reasons we're weird about math <laughs> is because we weren't taught it very well. We were taught it in a way that brought the abstract in too soon. We hadn't played with math concepts early on, and that became problematic for us. We were building all of these ideas on no good foundation. Whereas we think, oh, the times tables, there's your foundation. But how many of us could rattle off the times tables but couldn't do the word problems? And the word problems is how real life happens. I mean, not the, could you buy 17 cantaloupes? There's a Charlie Brown um, meme that has Sally asking, first, I wanna know who needs 17 cantaloupes and what is going on in their world? <laughs> <laughs> and those were the kinds of things that distracted me too when I was doing word problems. But remember, learning, um, see, I go off track. Learning comes from interests, and that means any interests. 
So we have to set aside that value judgment on what's important and what's not important. Because if you have an interest, it will take you where you need to go. And like school tries to get you to learn a whole bunch and hope you remember. Unschooling says live your life. And then when you bump into a something you don't know, that's when you learn it. And that becomes a reason to learn it. And it's relevant and it's in context and it stays with you. And then you can move forward. And that's in a nutshell how this, how this works. So what happens in your kids' days? What happens in your days? You know, maybe it's cooking and fixing meals and hiking or dealing with the pets or having conversations or playing video games or bo board games or card games or dice games or crafts or outside play or inside play, stories as families read, whether it's watching movies or listening to audiobooks, maybe going out to eat, having community service. Think about what happens in your day. So let's look at, let's just look at this, for example. This is a, um, one of the PDFs that I have in my membership group. And I just thought I would bring it over here and show it to you. So think of just cooking. People are like, well, you can't learn everything just baking chocolate chip cookies. Well, but you can learn a lot. You can learn that you like cooking and that can lead to something else. And think of it always as one dot that leads to another dot that leads to another dot. But some of the things just to think about of um, what do you learn when you cook with them? They're learning math where they learn measuring and estimates and timers and sequencing skills and shapes and colors and sorting. And so I think by going through these kinds of things, and we'll do this with a few topics, I think it's going to help you start to see learning outside the box of a, of a um, subject. So all these subjects happen in the simple activity of meals and cooking. All these subjects happen, some more than others, some more one day than other days. So they learn about geometry where they're learning volume and size of bowls and pans and the changing shapes of food as they're cooking. They learn about science, the heat, the chemical reactions, the taste, the digestion, the physiology of eating. They learn language arts where they're learning to read ingredients and comprehending directions and seeing what is a clear way to write that versus a confusing way to write that. Um, they're learning about health, what is healthy to eat, why are some foods deemed unhealthy? How does our body feel when we eat various foods? From social studies, they might learn where, you know, and this is just going to happen in conversation. Where are ingredients grown? Maybe when they're buying the, the ingredients at the grocery store and you can see that it comes from a different place. And what is that? And what is this other thing that's right here next to it? And what cultures eat this? And is that similar or different in other cultures? Or is this a recipe from grandma? And what was her life like? And then life skills, learning how to use new tools, acquire new skills, and all that increases confidence, making conversations, developing a list of recipes they're competent making, expanding their palate, and having fun with their parents. And all of these things happen. I have lots of times people say, oh, he didn't do much. I mean, he helped me make lunch, or he helped me fix dinner or he, you know, we made some pancakes together, but you had conversations and you had a whole lot of this exposure happening. And that's that foundation that I was talking about when kids didn't, didn't know what to hook the abstract math onto. It was because they hadn't had enough life experience to create a strong base. So conceptually, when we can deal with all these things in a conversation with hands-on experience, in a, in a warm, nurturing environment, it stays with us. And then later, if we want to go further with it, we could learn a little bit more about how different things happen. We might decide we like the, the science aspect of it, or maybe we like the cultural aspect of it. You don't know what your kid's path is going to be. So just having these different life experiences with them is laying the groundwork as simple as it may feel. Um, it's laying really important groundwork.
even things like just playing outside. So he says, well, all they did was just play with Legos. All they did was just play outside. Some of these things, let's just go through them. They're building, they're dealing with patterns. There was a bunch of articles written there for a while about um, schools, that were high schools that were taking kids outside I mean, pre-COVID, but taking them outside to build homes for homeless people or to build different things that needed to be done in the community. And that that was their math class. It was practical geometry. It was practical math application with measuring and trial and error and geometry. And, you know, that also <coughs> like this little one on the end is learning how much does this bucket hold? Does it overflow? What does it do? What happens when I mix that soap in? They're learning all these different things that are basically scientific principles. It's the scientific method, which is that you have an idea and you make a stab at it. Then you see whether that will be duplicated or no, there was something wrong with that idea until you're like, yep, that makes that. And that's how scientific method works. Um, but outside, they learn things like weather, earth science, they learn about plants, they learn about seasons, they learn about their own body as they exercise or don't exercise. Um, in language arts, they learn make-believe. You know, it's, it's story and character development when they're just out there playing pretend. But they're also reading signs and reading labels they learn a little about health, what's healthy to eat, why are some foods deemed unhealthy, how does our body feel when we eat various foods. From social studies and geography, they learn about the landscape in your area versus other places. Maybe they've been somewhere else and they can compare it to where their cousins live and or they're thinking about the history of the area. What do people do when, when they lived in this area 200 years ago? What was their life like? What was it like 100 years ago? What was it like 50 years ago? And all of that is kind of a geographical um, social studies type of focus. Um, and then life skills where they're developing strengths and interpersonal skills. And those are things that are really going to carry with them. They're really important. And acquiring skills based upon that particular activity, you may have a kid that's really into building. And next thing you know, they're also building Lego or they're building these kind of tree hut things, or then they're building catapults or other things. And you keep moving in that direction and you discover, wow, they really are kind of interested in this. And they're kind of on a little engineering trajectory, or maybe they're, um, they're more interested in the art side of it. And so they're on a more artistic trajectory and that's okay. So you just continue to play with in the moment instead of worrying about how you're gonna make a career out of putting soap bubbles in a bucket. You don't know, you don't know. And maybe it's the meta part. Maybe it's the trial and error. Maybe it's learning, here's how I test my theories. And it's going to have zero to do with soap in a bucket but it was one of a multitude of practices as they got to where they needed to be. So when they can focus on the thing that's interesting to them, instead of somebody saying, nobody makes a career out of soapy water, um, instead of something that shuts it down, well, let's get some other size buckets. Let's put some food coloring in the, in the soapy water. What would you like to do? and then they can start to experiment and play because one thing leads to another. We have a very limited um, idea of what's the, what the future holds, you know, where we think we just have this kind of linear straight shot to how they're gonna make a career out of something when in fact, they're all over the place. Who knows how they'll make a career? And it may have something to do with the specific topic at hand or it may, this may just be a building place for something else tomorrow. And so that's why that focusing on the present is so important. And sometimes just learning to play, it's okay to have fun. You know, we've had a lot of conditioning to believe, stop that playing, now it's time to buckle down. But we need more fun. We need more play in our lives. And if you're like, oh yeah, my kid's got plenty of play. <laughs> um, Remember learning how to, to 
move your way through the world, how to navigate it. It's full of trial and error. And so it's okay if it's not balanced. It'll, in, in the grand scheme of things, in the big arc of life, um, there'll be the balance that needs to be. All right. So even things like story time that you think, well, okay, so that's language arts. What else is it? It's also, you know, the cost of the movie or the book, or how long is it going to take to read it? How many pages are there? Will we have to pace ourselves? Will we do a chapter a day? Um, are there math concepts in the storyline? Is it about shapes or patterns or time? And so language arts is more than just learning to read. It's enjoying the story. It's seeing the word in the sentence structure. It's listening to the arc of the story. It's noticing if music changes the experience of the story if you're watching it on TV or on YouTube. Or maybe it's the art of it. Maybe it's the fashion and the drawings and the photo and the cinematography. Or maybe it's learning a healthy way to relax. You know, they're all the different subjects, social studies, geography, history, science, all those things are, um, are present in different books. So as they move through something else, they might be getting more about history or maybe they're learning something in there. Even if it's not a science book, there may be something about weather and think of little kids and maybe it's Curious George and he's doing something and it brings these subjects into their life. You didn't have to go find a first grade reader to, to do that, you could just read books that are interesting to them. And then for bigger kids, maybe they're listening, maybe it's audiobooks. Maybe you're in the car a lot and audiobooks are a good way to just have exposure to other interesting stories and let those be conversation starters for you. So you're like, wow, that was really a mean way. I can't imagine if somebody had a mom or dad like that. Or, oh, I can't imagine a friend talking to me like that. I don't know what I would do. What would you do? So you just start to engage and all of these create connections between you so that you can understand them better. And when you understand them better, then you know what to bring into their, into their world. So from a life skill standpoint, you know, finding hobbies, connecting with their parents, watching behavior patterns or traits of the characters in the book, all those kinds of things. But the one that people worry the most about has to do with video games. People are like, all he wants to do is play on the computer. All he wants to do is, all she wants to do is to be on social media, on the phone. But that's not all that's happening. You're kind of sweeping with a, a broad brush. And so if you want to pause this and take a screenshot, you can. And um, because there's a lot of skills that are developing because a kid is playing with their devices, whether, you know, we sometimes just call it all screen time, when in fact, they're, they're learning all kinds of skills. They're learning practical skills, interpersonal skills. They're learning um, topics like how to read or math or statistics, or maybe it's making a strategy or learning how to plan or how to pace themselves. And it's messy because they're doing it for themselves. So they're going to overextend from time to time. They're going to get frustrated. They're going to um, learn by trial and error and that's okay. And so if we can just be compassionate and think, all right, here's where their interest is taking them. And on this buffet of life for this week, let's see what other things are happening too, so that we can have other things in our world. And that doesn't mean, okay, so we have two hours of computer and two hours of piano and two hours of community service and two hours, I don't mean that. I just mean talking with them about what, how do you want the week to go? What kinds of things can we do? We as a family, I'd like us to do this. Here's why. You'd like to do this and here's why. And how can we negotiate this? But this page here is to help you see all the learning that's happening. So you don't have to just bristle at the idea as you walk past them on their computer. You can think about, well, what do I see? What are they doing? And oh, look, they get to be kind of a little leader in that group. Or oh, they get to um, learn different skills. So I think that 
I think it's a lot bigger and full of opportunities that parents also often get scared and kind of swept away with the anti-technology sentiment that floats across Facebook and all of, all of most of society, um, which is how we have traditionally dealt with anything new. The generations before don't like it, distrust it, think it's going to be the downfall. They thought that way about reading books. They thought that way about teaching the public to write. They thought all these things were going to be problematic and it's just how humans resist progress. So you might want to notice, is that what this is about? Is that what I'm doing? And so if you, if you need more information on technology, I have a bunch um, at the Unschooling Mom to Mom Facebook group that you can look in there and see a lot of articles that might help offset some of the anti-technology um, articles that you've probably seen. That when you start to search back, you see there might have been an agenda for who wrote that and why they wrote it. Another great book that we did in our um, membership group, we do a book club reading a couple times a year, and we did the book um, Bad For You, which is, uh, I don't know the guy's name, um, but it's the war, exposing the war on fun. And it is a graphic novel. So it's, that was kind of weird because it was hard for me to like, I'm, I evidently am far more academic minded than I thought because I was like, oh, graphic novel, oh Lord. <laughs> but it was fine and it was really good and, and eye opening. So I would recommend it. And if you don't, you can write me at coaching at suepatterson.com and I can tell you the link for it. Um, or you can join our membership group because the recording is there in our little private platform. So these are some um, graphics that I've made over the years. I'm trying to see where my notes are because I just kind of went off track. Um, I just thought I'd toss them here to help you see. And, and maybe these are some of your thoughts over here to the right, like why all that curriculum um, like all that curriculum money I can save now for family activities and help the kids soar with their interests or wonder what fun um, adventures we could actually do because we're not spending money on a math curriculum or a reading curriculum. And so these are different ideas if you just if you want to screenshot this too. It's also I think all of these three are at Instagram. If you scroll through Unschooling Mom to Mom, you'll see it. And of course, it's at the membership group. Um, but for different ways that um, how do unschoolers learn these basics, because a lot of times that's what people are worried about the basics. And remember, the basics are the basics because they show up in life. They when we're, when we're able to just engage in what's happening for the day, then we are, um, we're able to notice what was happening right there in front of us. Instead of, sorry, can't look at that. Got to get lesson three from the curriculum and we'll never get through this. And then we miss all the stuff that's happening right around us. So pulling these kinds of things to the front of your mind, looking at all these different ways, um, these would be this will be helpful for you. Um, let's see, what else do I have? Oh, this one. This is one that's in a couple of the unschooling guides and then also at the membership. And go ahead and you can screenshot this too if you want. That this just kind of gives you a little jumping off place about, oh yeah, this is the kind of activities we do. And this is why I don't have to do a curriculum or a subject. And so when you have, sometimes when you have spouses that are like, yeah, well, our kid will never get around to science or never get around to something, whatever it is, then you can look at, well, would they do these things? Maybe. And so this would be ways that you would notice, oh, they already are doing these things. And, and then what other things would you even put on there? There would probably even be more. So that's a possibility. Um, it just starts, it's really about reframing though, right? It's about getting your brain out of that conformity, out of that one size fits all, only one right answer approach. And yeah, so these are the different ways that, that you can dive deeper. 
if that's something that you're interested in doing. Um, all these different guides are available just one at a time. If you wanted to just kind of pace yourself and work on one every month, that'd be an easy way to start with the things that worry you the most. Um, but there's a link at Unschooling Mom to Mom here. There's a link for the, for the membership or the course or the guides or the coaching if you would if you're interested in that. And I have a PDF that, let me see where I have it. Um, I'll put it in the chat so that you can get this free PDF that can help you see where all these subjects happen in real life. So let's see if there was something. All right, that's you with the brown paper bag. <laughs> um, let's see. Introducing concepts too early can be detrimental. We tried that for several things and it ended poorly. And now I go with the flow on their interest in their learning. Absolutely. Oh, let me come back with my face. Yeah, because I think that that's, for some reason, that's what school has done, that they have pushed um, pushed kids to do stuff early. Partly, I mean, when you think about it, it's, it's quantifiable. It's, it's easy to check the box. It's easy to teach the teachers to teach this. These are what they should know. We'll have a bell curve and some will get it and some won't. And we'll teach it again next year a little bit deeper and some will get it and some won't and some will get, you know, and one of the side effects of that is we make kids really uninterested in learning. We're like, oh gosh, there comes, here comes that fun science class. You know, I'll never, I'm always so shocked when somebody says, oh, I hate science. And because gosh, really? It's intriguing. There are so many cool things. You probably just hate how schools teach science or you hate how schools taught history. But I just read this great book about Hamnet, the son of Shakespeare and how he might've been a catalyst for why he wrote Hamlet and what was happening in Shakespeare's life and his family's life while he was off running the Globe Theater what was happening and it's partly fictionalized because probably a lot because um, they don't have a lot of data and but it was intriguing and I learned a lot about that time period and it was just a fascinating book and I would have said oh history <laughs> but there it is you know it was really interesting and so I think that when we, when we can step away from a schoolish subject and think more about topics, think more about um, interests, and then let the schooly part, let the subjects, let them fill in as needed. So for my kids, we kind of lived like school didn't exist. And so when, um, when they got older and they were like, well, I think I want to do this and you not have to have a degree for that. I'm like, okay, then let's, what do you need? And so then they took the assessment at the community college and they had a couple of stumbling blocks and we tackled it. And then they went on and they either took the developmental classes that they needed or they just passed the test, took it a second time. And okay, now you get it. You didn't know that when you write a persuasive paper, you can't talk about both sides you, like you would in real life. You have to just have your one side, three supporting arguments, let the conclusion be the, you know, the reverse of the intro. Oh, okay, when I do that, then I can pass it. Yeah. And so we can just help them move through and do what they need to do. Um, let's see, Kim says, I'm, oh, wait a minute, let's go back. Allison says, the hardest thing for me was learning that play is learning, allowing my kids to just play and play and play, and that's okay. And um, Kim says, I'm beginning to see the benefits of letting my kids lead. I'm shocked by some of the things that I see from them. Yeah, and when you think about that and you think about they are um, 
exploring their interests. You know, would you have thought that would be their interest? No. Did I know my daughter was going to set up her farm on the sidewalk in the front with all the slugs that were in the garden, all the little snails? No. Did she become a big animal person? Oh, yeah. And but that was like early on, she was doing things like that. So you let them just keep playing with those things. And then next thing you know, they're watching some discovery channel and they're like did you know that they're called this and they have this and you're like i would never have talked about that <laughs> and yet they know it and that's what can happen when we give them room to explore um i did want i love seeing their curiosity spark and them diving right into a topic exactly i want to also show you because a couple of you had mentioned that you have kindergartners so let me go back to my share for a second and if I can make it not so big. Um, so you can see how giant my, how, what a mess my screen is. But I wanted to, somebody had asked about kindergarten and I have something, I have something on that. And I also have something on play. And so let me come here to the blog. We'll look up kindergarten and I'll put the link in the chat for you. Um, unschooling kindergarten. So it's things like, how do they play with language arts? How do they play with math? How do they play with science? So it's really not just kindergarten, it's any kid that is still kind of seriously into play. And so here's the link for that. And then the other one, what was the other one? Play. I have a podcast. And so I have the um, transcript for it here, unschooling and playtime. If you need help figuring out how do I get okay with all this play? You know, I'm thinking we shouldn't really be playing this much, but like they want you to, things that people say, like they won't learn anything if I let them play or how will they be prepared or what's going on? And so the different things that you can do, time for action. So here is, something about play. Okay, Mary says, I struggle with helping my kids buy in. They are sure they are dumb and missing out because we don't follow a curriculum or do worksheets. Um, Kim says, my 14 year old feels the same way. She has some sleepless nights because she believes that she's behind her friends. And I'll have to tell you that I, my kids occasionally had that same thing. And Alyssa had it when she was younger. She wanted to be on the drill team at school, but she says, I can't go because I don't even know my times tables by heart. You know, I'm not smart. I'm like, oh, you are plenty smart. Times tables does not really indicate smartness. And, um, and so she did end up dipping her foot in the high school waters so that she could see what that was like. She was the youngest and she was one that wanted to, explore on her own a lot of trial and error and um so she did it for a little over a year year and a half and um and then came back out and like okay now i know <laughs> it's not like a lizzie mcguire movie at all um and then so and then my son had that experience when he went to community college because he thought yeah i passed the test but you know i haven't been doing this stuff and um he says i got there and Nobody even shows up for class. They only show up for the test. Here, I want to have this engaging Socratic <laughs> experience. Nobody else wants to. And, um, and so he learned that he was plenty smart. So I think that sometimes the way to counter that might be something I didn't do. And that might be to talk to them about this is deliberate. This is not just mom's too busy to be bothered by you or you fought me so much on that math curriculum. Now I've washed my hands of it. Now look at this mess you've made. <laughs> so even if you're not saying that, that can sometimes be the message they hear, right? And, um, and so instead it's like, wow, look at all these places you learn math. Look at all of these um, um, ways that you're smart. Help them find their strengths. Help them see what they are good at. 
help them notice, oh, she is really good at that. She's not so good at this other thing, but she's good at that. Oh, just like me. I'm really good at this, but not this. And dad's really good at this, but not this. You're really good at this and not so much that. We all have strengths and weaknesses. And that's what makes for an interesting world is that everybody can kind of complement each other. So it is also really hard at that age because at that 13, 14 year old age developmentally, it's all about figuring out where do I fit in? Where do I how do I fit in? And there's this really inaccurate notion that everybody else has been given the secret handshake that they didn't tell you. And so they think everybody else gets it. And when you can remind them, no, everybody else is just as nervous because this is just what happens as we move into teen years. We start to, we're, we're moving away from being a little kid, but we're not an adult yet. And so it's very messy and muddy. And this is having all that self-doubt, that's part of it. So let's think about where are things that we can help you build up so that you can feel confident. You're really good at talking to people. You're really good at finding things. You're really good at, I don't know, whatever it is that they're good at. And then you can help them um, see that they have strengths and that anything else is just something they could do and they could improve if they want. Sometimes that idea of, <coughs> yeah, they say they want to do it, and then they, when the time comes, they're like, yeah, but not now. <laughs> and what happens is that they have kind of conditioned their own mind to believe from experiences that a good kid says yes to this, a good kid learns this, a good daughter does this, a good son does this, and I want to be that, so I'll say yes except for I don't really want to do that. <laughs> and so then in the moment, they don't really want to do that. And it really, it, they, they didn't really want to. Um, because a lot of those things that if you just wait a couple of years, if it's relevant, they'll do it and they'll want to. You know, like my kids taking a math class where they'd never done a math book at all other than when I would have like a panic attack and toss a key to workbook you don't know percentages oh my gosh oh my gosh and they're like oh there she goes again <laughs> so instead of having that moment where you look like the crazy person um just have a conversation about you know that game's going on sale 25 percent off here's how you figure it out and if you don't turn it into a giant lesson then they're more inclined to listen especially if it's their money, not so much if it's your money. <laughs> so, so sometimes learning about money is an important thing to do. And um, I don't know, does any of that help Kim or Mary? Because I just kind of ramble on about the young. Yeah, that's kids. great. It makes a total sense and it kind of gives me peace that, okay, this is an expected yeah. transition um, mm -hmm. and that we'll get through it. <laughs> right. Um, we do have, Mary's in our in the membership group, but we do have a few PDFs if that was something that you were ever wanted a little more support on if you I have PDFs about how to help kids find their strengths or how to um, different things that have to do with those teenage years I have a lot about that I have a book called homeschooled teens, and it might be helpful for you or your child to look at that is. Um, all the questions that people asked about, well, how did they learn? How did they, did they get into college? What was that experience like? Um, did they make friends? Did they, you know, all the questions, like 25 of them. Do they hate their mom now? <laughs> all those kinds of things. And they, 75 young people from 15 to 39 answered and helped people see, oh, that's how they did that. That's how they did that in California and how they did it in Arkansas and how they did it in Pennsylvania and how they did it in Florida, in a little town, in a rural town, in a big city, you know, all the different, all the different possibilities so that you can at least start to crack that grip of everybody is this, everybody has this, and I don't. And in fact, no, everybody has all different combinations and variables you know so those are possibilities too so reach out if you need help if you want um 
more information on some of those things or you know lots of times people can kind of no oh, i just need to get the podcast <laughs> and bring it to the front of my mind and then i'm good because it just depends on where you are on the um Mm, on the continuum of fear <laughs> of of not being sure and wanting more support and um and sometimes it's helpful just to hear other parents too so that's another possibility all right well we're getting close i think she said um 2 30 let me get you the reframing thing hang on a second um, and that is that PDF that just kind of gives you a little bit of guidance. Um, it's over in the membership group, Mary, but for the others, um, I'll have it just a second. Oh, I thought I would have it just a second. <laughs> I'll have to bring it over to the group. I'll put it in the chat in the group so I don't hold y'all up. And um, I'll, I'll get that over there and make sure everybody gets it. If you want to sign up for my email list, just send me your email and you can send it at coaching at suepatterson.com and I can get you the reframing PDF, reframing learning education. Um, and then I have a weekly emails and podcasts and things like that so it was great talking with you all i hope it was helpful and um i will close this out and then we'll have to go back to the other zoom call does everybody understand how to do that cody maybe you can um put the link in the chat if you're here to redirect people back to the main group let me see if I can find it real fast. Because sometimes people are kind of here. <laughs> um, or if any of you already have it. Okay. I um, I have it. I'm going to go ahead and drop it. In the chat? Yeah. Oh, that'd be so great. Kate. I hope that works. It's, I just copied that from my email. Okay, wonderful. Well, thanks for being here. I hope it was helpful. All right. Thank you so much, Sue. That was great. You're welcome. I'll talk to y'all over in the yeah, other group. Over there. Okay. Okay. Bye, y'all. Okay.